Let's kick things off. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Derek Hira. I am the director of the Metropolitan Policy Center. This is our urban speaker series. Uh, this is the second one of the semester. And last week, we had Amanda Boston. I know there's some people that were here uh, for her talk. And she talked a lot about Brooklyn and the gentrification of Brooklyn. And I said that we've got a speaker coming the following week, and that's this week. And we have Jeffrey Parker here today, and he's going to take us into Bridgeport. So we're going from Brooklyn to Bridgeport, and Bridgeport is a community that is gentrifying in Chicago. Um, so I'm so pleased to have Jeffrey uh, with us today. Jeffrey is a longtime friend and colleague of mine. Uh, basically, you should know when we go to the conference circuits, we go drinking, right? <laughs> and we talk sociology, and we talk ethnography. And he is a fantastic ethnographer, um, and you're going to see that today. Um, but Dr. Parker is an urban sociologist, and he is broadly interested in issues of place reputation at the level of the neighborhood, the city, and the region. Uh, more specifically, he focuses on how perceptions of place structure actions and inequality. He draws on interviews, ethnography, firsthand participant observation, archival research, uh, and he has written about the poli political consequences of racialized perceptions of disorder, administrative strategies of racialized voter suppression, and the consequences of neighborhood stigma on gentrification. Uh, he is currently working on a book, and he just told me today that he landed an advanced contract with Columbia University Press. So that's impressive. A little applause for Jeffrey for that. Um, but this book uh, looks at the role of small businesses uh, and the social production and maintenance of neighborhood reputation in Chicago neighborhoods. So we're going to hear about Bridgeport, and I'm sure he's also going to talk about some of the other neighborhoods that he's looked at in Chicago. And a lot of gentrification scholars look at the gentry, the influx of upper income people. And what makes Jeffrey's work unique is that he looks at small business arrival and small businesses' perceptions of the neighborhood, but also how they change uh, the neighborhood. So Dr. Parker has published in prestigious journals, including Social Problems, The Built Environment, and city and community. Uh, he is also, maybe we should applaud this, but he just received, I think this year, or the just very end of last year, an esteemed National Science Foundation Award to expand his city and neighborhood research in Atlanta. So the NSF is like one of the best awards you can get. So congratulations to you on, on getting that. Now there's another award. Um, there's another award that he received a little bit back in 2018, I have to mention it because he got the Robert Park Lectureship um, at the University of Chicago. So that goes to the one of the best doctoral students at Chicago in sociology. So Jeffrey got that in 2018. I bring it up because I won that award way back in the day. I think it was 2005. Um, but, but Jeffrey comes from uh, the University of Chicago, and that's where he got his PhD in 2019. Um, and like I said, he's a sociologist, but beyond the University of Chicago, his education comes from other institutions, local institutions here in DC, and he has a BA from George Washington University in arts, in history, and English. Um, and I give that some emphasis because you're going to see that his presentation style and what he displays is artistic. Also, you know, we're not going to read his work, but his writing is incredible. And that, I guess, we owes to George Washington University. They're kind of a competitor of ours, but, you know, we push each other. So um, the English and the history degree, I think, adds a lot to your, to your work. Um, he is currently a professor, assistant professor in sociology at the University of New Orleans. Um, so please help me welcome Jeffrey Parker to American University. That's quite an introduction. Uh, thank you, Derek. Um, I'd like to thank the Metropolitan Policy Center in American uh, for having me here. Thank you, Christian, for helping to organize it all. Um, like Derek said, I'm happy to be back in DC. It's a place that holds a special place in my heart. Um, yeah, right now I'm at University of New Orleans, but I'm spending 
the next six months in Atlanta working on what's going to be my second book, but this is research for my first book um, based on my dissertation research in Chicago. Um, so it's tentatively titled Bad Reputation, the Causes and Consequences, what we think we know about cities and neighborhoods coming to a bookstore near you at some undetermined time. <laughs> um, so I'm going to try to go through it relatively quickly. Um, I might skip over some uh, method sections and things like that just so I can um, get to the question and answer session because I want to hear from y'all. Um, as Derek said, I am going to be talking about Bridgeport today. I'm also going to be talking about Woodlawn, which is on the south side of Chicago, and that's where this photograph is taken. Um, but before I actually get into the neighborhoods, I want to talk about sort of the broad structures of my project. Um, so this, of course, is Donald Trump. Um, and it's specifically Donald Trump from September 2016 um, during the first presidential debate um, against Hillary Clinton. Um, this debate took place on Long Island at Hofstra University, right outside New York City. But the city that he talked about that night over and over and over again, and that he had talked about on the campaign trail over and over and over again, was about 800 miles away um, in Chicago, Illinois. And we've got a quote from um, President Trump. We have a situation where we have our inner cities. African-Americans, Hispanics are living in hell because it's so dangerous. You walk down the street, you get shot. In Chicago, they've had thousands of shootings, thousands since January 1st, thousands of shootings. And I say, where is this? Is this a war-torn country? What are we doing? Um, so um, there are a few lessons this example teaches us about place, um, reputation, which is what I'll be talking about with you today. Um, but before I do, I want to offer sort of a definition so we're all on the same page. Um, this is the broad um, argument I'm about to make, which is people have reputations, but so do places, and those reputations have consequences. Um, place reputation is what people think they know about a specific place is, whether they have specific firsthand knowledge of it or not. It's a type of knowledge that's not dependent on firsthand experience, but on the circulation of ideas, descriptions, accusations, and insinuations in both public and private spheres. And um, functionally, it serves as a heuristic. Um, or a shortcut that people use to make decisions when they have incomplete information about a place. So when you're deciding whether or not to go to a neighborhood, whether or not to go to a restaurant, whether or not to um, rent or buy in a place, you use neighborhood reputation because you don't actually know about the neighborhood firsthand. Um, so there are a couple of things that we need to talk about here um, in terms of what reputations do in cities. Um, so first of all, neighborhoods have um, material consequences, right? Um, so just to give an example, um, Rahm Emanuel, who was the mayor of Chicago um, at the time that Trump, um, President Trump made those remarks, knew that the bars about Chicago's violence problem could lead to negative consequences for his, his city's tourism industry and potentially for his political career. So he began aggressively pushing Chicago as a tourist destination in response. Um, not everyone lives in Chicago, and of those who don't, not everyone has the time or the inclination to learn about it on a granular level. So they rely on knowledge of its reputation to make consequential decisions, like whether to go there and spend their money or not. Um, think about, again, all the time that you've used a similar thought process about whether to go to a certain place you haven't been before, and you decide to go because it has a reputation for being cool or interesting, or you decide not to go because it has a reputation for being boring or even dangerous. Um, so this has ramifications for actual decision-making on the ground. Um, an example of this in research is from Assad Assad, who lives at Stanford. Um, he's shown that undocumented immigrants draw on perceptions about neighborhoods' connections to law enforcement to make decisions about where to live. Um, a corollary lesson here is that reputations have consequences regardless of whether or not, whether or not they're what we might call true. Um, so for example, there's been a lot written about how Chicago is not actually as dangerous as it's portrayed in the media, about how there are other cities that are much more dangerous than our nation's third largest. Um, these are um, two charts, one of which shows that cities that people think are safe and unsafe. Um, you see, we're in Washington, D.C., um, which um, is up there, but not as high as Chicago. Chicago, at least in this poll, is definitely considered the most unsafe city. Um, in America. And then you see um, America's most dangerous cities, uh, Palm based on homicide rate per 100,000 residents over the last five years. Um, by far the highest is my current city, New Orleans. Um, DC is higher than Chicago too, but none of this really matters when people are actually making decisions because they're not making decisions 
on statistics or making decisions based on sort of gut decisions that come from reputation. Um, you know, unless you're a social scientist, I guess. Um, so, uh, what, for example, here, what matters about this headline for the purpose of people's decision making on the ground is not that Chicago is not the most dangerous city in America, but rather that people think that it is. Um, another story, aspect this story draws attention to is the way reputations are perpetuated. Um, they come from a diffuse set of sources, which makes them durable. I started by talking about Donald Trump, but I could also talk about media sources, about musicians, and even about cell phone apps. Uh, Chicago's reputation as a dangerous place goes back at least, if you're a historian, my historian brain here, goes back at least to Al Capone, and it's been burnished in recent years by the concept of shy rap, um, which got turned into a Spike Lee movie and a vice documentary series about Chief Keith and other local drill rappers in Inglewood and Woodlawn. Um, as to the cell phone apps, there are actually a couple that you can choose from. Uh, Sketch Factor was a crowdsourced platform that allowed the user to avoid quote unquote sketchy neighborhoods. Um, it was soon met with an article in Ballywag about how its founders, um, smiling young white people, make app for avoiding yeah. black neighborhoods. Um, another example is Ghetto Tracker, um, which similarly crowdsourced opinions about what neighborhoods are unsafe, perceptions that we know from research by folks like Quillian and Pager and Chrysan and Bader um, is highly correlated with race. Um, Ghetto Tracker also had smiling white people on their website, as you can see, um, although it got throwback and they made a radical change by changing the name of the website or the app to Good Part of Town and putting smiling black people up instead. Um, both apps are now gone, but the desire doc to document and to quantify racialized reputations remains. Um, so reputations, while real and consequential, is also diffuse and almost never has a single source. This is important because it makes reputations persistent. Unlike rumor, which is falsifiable, or gossip, which moves through particular social networks, reputation is more durable because its existence is decentralized and is premised on an assertion about the way something fundamentally is as opposed to whether or not something happened. So just to give an example, there might be a rumor that someone got shot last night in a neighborhood in DC or Chicago, and you could check on that. You could find out whether or not that's true. Um, but if somebody tells you that DC or Chicago is a dangerous place, there's no real way to prove that one way or the other. Um, so this gets to the larger project, and this is the part I'm sort of going to speed through. I'm happy to answer questions about any of this, but I want to get to the actual data. Um, the theoretical puzzle is in a society where place reputation is visible, consequential, and potentially manageable, how does a neighborhood's reputation structure economic inequality, economic action, and either disrupt or reproduce um, inequality? Um, the way I did this was I talked to merchants in these neighborhoods. I talked to merchants because um, they're the first point of contact for neighborhood outsiders and tourists. They're acutely aware of their neighborhood's reputations because they have to be in order to make a living. Um, they don't get paid if people don't come to their neighborhoods, basically. Um, and they are active participants in the construction and the contestation of neighborhood reputation, as I'm going to show you. Um, the empirical research question is how do merchants and gentrifying neighborhoods make consequential decisions in light of their neighborhood's reputations? Um, the methods, I did in-depth interviews, I did participant observation, I did three neighborhoods in Chicago, I'm going to mostly focus on two of them today. The target population was owners and managers, but I also talked to other stakeholders, I talked to religious leaders, I talked to politicians. Um, I did about 100 interviews, um, I did 100, and I'm going back and doing some more interviews now as I turn into a book. Um, I sampled for range within the population using case study logic. Um, Neighborhoods can have different kinds of place reputations. You just think of a place that has a reputation for a certain kind of sexuality. So like the neighborhood um, is Jason Orrin and Neo Korean have written about um, ethnicity, fun, boringness, hipness, racism, and violence. Uh, those are actually the ones that ended up um, in my study, those last three. So you have Wicker Park, um, which has a reputation for hipness, Bridgeport, which has a reputation for racism, and Woodlawn, which has a reputation for violence. Um, and you see three different responses from merchants in these neighborhoods that I'm going to talk about. Um, consolidation in Wicker Park, contestation in Bridgeport, and exploitation in Woodlawn. Um, so before I get into the actual neighborhoods, I want to talk a little bit about um, why I chose Chicago, um, because people point out quite rightly that Chicago is the most overstudied city um, in the world, perhaps maybe others in London. Um, and it's a unique case, um, and that's actually why I chose it. It's not an average case. It's an extreme case insofar as the city is specifically known for its neighborhoods, and the city itself takes advantage of this fact. 
Um, the advantage from an extreme case, as people like Eric Kleinberg and Marcel Mauss have argued, is that the social mechanisms of interest are most readily apparent on the surface. Um, there's also, it, Chicago is an incredibly diverse place, but it's also an incredibly segregated place. Um, Robert Escher Park, who the lecture that Eric and I had was named after, was at University of Chicago, and he famously said, the processes of segregation establish moral distances which make the city a mosaic of little worlds which touch but do not interpenetrate. Um, this speaks to the idea that, and there's really no other way to put this, um, Chicago is a diverse place, but it is also a place that has a long history of violence, discrimination, and segregation. Um, just to give an example, this is Dr. King, who had obviously um, done a lot of um, justice work in the American South. Um, this is a picture of him after he got a rock thrown at him in Marquette Park, which is on the near south side, which at the time um, was a white neighborhood sort of undergoing um, white flight. And he said, I've been in many demonstrations all across the South, but I can say that I've never seen, even in Mississippi and Alabama, mobs as hostile and as hate-filled as I've seen here in Chicago. So um, I'm going to go over Wicker Park pretty quickly um, because of the three neighborhoods, it's sort of the simplest story. Um, and we only have a little bit of time today. And I want to get to what you all talk about. But it does sort of create the baseline for how we might expect our reputation to act. Um, so um, Wicker Park is a neighborhood on the northwest side of Chicago. Um, it has been named in the top five of America's hippest hipster neighborhoods by Forbes magazine. So Forbes magazine has a place as hip. Um, you can be pretty sure that it's hip. Um, it became prominent this way in the 1990s when there are a lot of bands there. If you listen, I mean, Liz Fair or Joe Overkill, basically a lot of artists have moved in there. Um, the history you need to know about it is that it was um, historically a site of first settlement among immigrants to Chicago. Um, Germans and Poles in the late 19th century, Mexicans and Puerto Ricans in the middle of the 20th century, and then as Chicago underwent white flight and deindustrialization um, in the 1970s and 80s, um, it became a place that artists went because there was a lot of cheap lived workspace. Um, and it became known as a place where there was a hipster scene. So if you've seen the 1990s movie High Fidelity, it takes place largely in bigger Park. Um, by the time I got to Wicker Park, though, things had changed dramatically. People didn't tend to think of the neighborhood as hip anymore. In fact, they all told me that if I was interested in music scenes, which is what I had gone there to start studying, that I was like 10 or 20 years too late. Um, and that the neighborhood was, you know, terrible now. It was uncool. Um, Richard Boyd has written a book about this. He refers to it um, as neighborhoods like this as always already being over. Um, so, um, there were conflicting desires and priorities among the merchants I talked to. There were some people that had, were artists and ran stores that sort of appealed to people that had come to this neighborhood because they wanted sort of a bohemian atmosphere. Um, and then there were chain stores that moved in. So there were people with different desires. Um, but, and it's certainly not a united bohemian front. Despite these differences, which are often swear by who business customers are or who they'd like them to be, which I can talk about, um, there's a remarkable degree of coordination in Wicker Park around its reputation for hipness, even as merchants will tell you they don't think they're going to put actually hip anymore. This is because everybody in the neighborhood realizes whether they like it or not, the reason they're all getting paid is because there's this persistent reputation. Um, so they're all able to sort of coordinate actions through business organizations and, and chambers of commerce um, through things like the, um, they call them SSA in Chicago, um, social service areas, which um, in other places, I guess, are business improvement districts, probably. Um, they have, um, they put out things like master plans for the neighborhood where they talk explicitly about the kind of people they're trying to attract. Um, so this is sort of a simple, understandable um, argument. But, you know, you have all sorts of different businesses, um, art galleries, thrift stores, shoe storage bars, artisanal donut stores, furniture stores, um, and coming from different economic backgrounds, you've got mom and pops and corporate stores, but they're all orienting themselves around a reputation for hipness because that's what gets them all paid. Um, this is sort of understandable. Um, what gets trickier is what I'm going to talk about with Woodlawn and Bridgeport, which is what do you do when you have a bad reputation? 
Um, so while the mechanisms of how it happens and which are part for interesting, the fact that merchants buy into a reputation that is on its face good for making money isn't really a surprise. Um, what about when people are having to deal with a reputation that nobody really wants? Or that on the surface nobody really wants. I'll get into the fact that in one of these neighborhoods, maybe some people do want it. Um, so Bridgeport is my first example. Bridgeport is on the near south side of Chicago. It is the oldest neighborhood in Chicago. Um, it was originally um, founded to house the mostly Irish immigrants that were building the San Antonio Canal. Um, at one point, it was referred to as hard scrabble. Um, it's a site of first location among multiple European immigrant communities, and the neighborhood has historically been ethnically polyglot and defined by the boundaries of the local Irish parishes and the neighborhood taverns. Uh, there have been Catholic churches for the Irish, the Italians, the Croatians, the Lithuanians, and the Poles, and corner bars for each group as well, and these still persist. Um, the neighborhood has become notorious for something else as well, though, which is racism among people of color. Um, so Jeremy is a Latino man in his 20s at the time who came to Schaller's Pump, which at the time before it closed was the oldest bar in Chicago. And he was there for the last week and wanted to see what it was like. And he was wearing a White Sox hat. Um, and I asked him about it because I knew he wasn't a White Sox fan. Um, and he said that this place has a history of not really liking other races. So the White Sox ballpark is down the street from Schaller's Pump. And he wanted to fit in as well as he possibly could. So he put on a White Sox hat um as a way of compensating for his own lack of whiteness um this reputation has followed the neighborhood since its beginnings in the 19th century um there were pro-confederacy marches in bridgeport during the civil war um and it's persisted even as the neighborhood has diversified with large numbers of chinese and mexican immigrants at this point if you look at the census data it's actually um there's no majority population but the um there are more um asian um non-Hispanic Asian people in Bridgeport than white people in Bridgeport. Um, but the reputation for anti-Black um, racism persists. So um, to give a very brief history of why this happened, uh, Bridgeport's been the site of racial conflict between Blacks and whites for a number of um, reasons over the years. Early conflicts um, centered on labor politics um, after the Great Migration, um, with newly arrived Blacks vilified for taking jobs for less money in the nearby stockyards. Uh, but there's also a long history of events marked by racial animus that don't really have to do with economics. Um, so 100 years ago, um, there's the Red Summer that some of you may know about. There were um, race riots all over the country. Um, a particularly bad one was in Chicago. Um, and this is a map from the commission that, um, that shows where all the deaths and arsons were. Um, it started when a young black boy um, was swimming uh, in Lake Michigan and he swam too close to the white beach. Somebody threw a rock at, uh, started throwing rocks at him. Um, one of them hit him. He drowned. The cops came. The cops didn't arrest the people that um, were throwing rocks at him. They did arrest black bystanders. Bystanders, um, riots happened. Riots, arson, systematic like white supremacist violence happened over the course of the next few days. Um, a thousand were left homeless as a result of widespread arson. The National Guard got called in eventually, and it's still the worst race riot in the history of Illinois. Um, so the Chicago Commission on Race Relations got tasked with determining the causes of the riot and determined that about 40% of the violence happened in Bridgeport. Um, this is a different map of related. Bit. So this is Bridgeport. Um, and that it happened mostly in the boundary between Bridgeport and um, this area, which is the Black Belt, which at the time um, was the only real area in Chicago that African Americans could live. Um, they specifically attributed it to what were called um, athletic clubs, but in reality, white youth gangs that controlled the boundaries between the areas. Um, one of these gangs was called the Hamburg Athletic Club, and in 1919, when the riot happened, it counted among its members 17-year-old Richard J. Daly. He would go on to rule Chicago with an iron fist um, and went his entire career in Chicago, neither confirming nor denying his participation in the riots. Um, Daly is, in fact, one of five Chicago mayors, um, including his son. Um, since 1931, um, I have this written down, I may be a year off, I may need to update this. The last year a Republican was the mayor of Chicago, there have been exactly 22 years out of a possible 92 when the mayor of Chicago was not a Democrat from Bridgeport. I'll just give you an idea of how central Bridgeport is to um, political power in Chicago. Um, in, addition, in addition to being an interesting fact, 
um, and politically consequential on municipal and national stages. If you know anything about presidential history, they say the Democratic machine out of Bridgeport is the reason Kennedy beat Nixon in um, 60. Uh, this fact has also contributed to Bridgeport's reputation for racial hostility. Um, so very briefly, um, throughout the early part of the 20th century, the South Side was mostly white, um, and it stayed mostly white, largely through some called restrictive covenants, um, which were in deeds and contracts that basically said that I'm selling you this house, but you're not allowed to sell it to somebody who fits into a certain group. And it could be any group, but it's usually used for Jews and mostly in Chicago, um, African-Americans. Um, so if you've seen or read A Raisin in the Sun, that's what it's that's what it's about, is what happens after 1948, when the Supreme Court ruled in Shelley versus Kramer that um, restrictive covenants were not enforceable. Um, so you see this massive uh, white flight from the South Side. Um, you don't really see it happening in Bridgeport, at least not until like 1970, 1980. And again, it's not because Blacks are moving into the neighborhood, it's because um, Asians and Latinos are moving in. And the reason is because Bridgeport had the machine. And because they had the machine, they had patronage jobs. Um, patronage jobs were things like you could be a cop or a fireman or streets and sand worker. Um, my favorite story of this is my friend told me he knew somebody whose dad had a patronage shop in Bridgeport where he um, ran the nearby bridge near the river. He helped lift the bridge up or put it down, except the bridge didn't lift and go down. It was just a no-show patronage job. Um, so because of that, um, Bridgeport remained white while the rest of the South Side emptied out and it became this sort of white island on the South Side. Um, while never reaching the levels of 1919 again, the border area between Bridgeport and the black areas of the South Side have um, continued to be patrolled and monitored often violently. Um, this is a case, um, Leonard Clark was a 13 year old African-American boy who was beaten into a coma in 1997. Um, in addition to literal monitoring um, and violence, there are cases during the civil rights era of civil rights protesters marching outside the Daily Home um, and being sprayed by anti-civil rights protesters from the neighborhood. Now, business owners talk about Bridgeport. It's not like that anymore, or it's at least much better than it was. And there's some evidence to support this um, assertion and suspect that it's something beyond just neighborhood boosterism, which I will talk about. Um, there is like, a movement, an anti-racist movement in Bridgeport. Um, but there's also persistent um, events of racism here. So this just from the last couple of years, there's been a lot of um, vigilantism and a lot of vandalism in the neighborhood of um, businesses owned by people of color in the neighborhood, particularly in response to um, Black Lives Matter. Um, the fact remains though, even beyond um, the question of whether or not Bridgeport is or isn't racist anymore, people think it is. Um, and that has consequences. So that's what I'm going to talk about um, and talk about how the merchants have responded. So Bridgeport, even among people who think there's nothing bad about it, is universally understood to be territorial. And talking about what they like about the neighborhood, people constantly talk about it feeling like a small town where everyone knows everyone and there's a general sense of community and cohesion. Um, Jamie runs a radio station in the neighborhood and he says, I have people come up to me and say that they never lived anywhere else in their block or somebody would say, oh, my sister moved away. And you'd be like, where to? Oh, true. They talked about it like it was a foreign nation. It's two blocks over. Uh, but that's how territorial and how tight knit also Bridgeport was. Uh, of course, what can be portrayed as charming by some can be read as threatening to, by others. Ed, who's a large property owner in the neighborhood, owns a bar, a brewery, and an art space. Remember, it's dealing with harassment in the neighborhood because of his ethnicity. He's half Korean and half Polish. Um, and he says, I started learning that everything's pretty terrible here. When we used to decry the racism here in Bridgeport, I learned that, you know what, it's just not white people hating black people here. Everyone hates everyone. The Italian guy hates the Irish guy. The Irish guy hates the Italian guy. Like that guy hates the dude in front of him, right? So he's not saying it's good. He's just saying it's bad in a lot of different terrible ways. Um, Mike owns Bridgeport Coffee, which started as a local shop and has expanded to other locations, especially in black neighborhoods on the south side. And because of that, he's run into the problem of what the name Bridgeport calls to mind in Black communities in Chicago. Um, he says in Black communities, and especially on the South Side, Bridgeport has this reputation for being an enclave for racism. Moms will tell their kids don't go to Bridgeport, but that's not what the modern Bridgeport's like, but that is still a perception and it lives. Now, one of the more famous scholarly treatments of this phenomenon um, of defending a neighborhood comes from Gerald Suttles. Um, and he talks about the concept of 
what he calls the defended neighborhood, a place that guarded against outsiders through a number of different mechanisms. Um, and he identifies them, uh, many of which we've talked about happening in um, Bridgeport. Um, delinquent gangs, check. Restrictive covenants, check. Uh, sharp boundaries, check. The neighborhoods in Chicago definitely have sharp boundaries. And by a forbidding reputation, what I call the defended neighborhood. Um, if Bridgeport is a classically independent neighborhood, people there are aware of it and trying to change it for a number of reasons. As a result, I found a different set of processes happening while I was there, which I call undefending the neighborhood. Undefending the neighborhood is characterized by a few different explicit strategies undertaken by merchants in the neighborhood to contest Bridgeport's reputation as a racist place. Um, so I don't have time to talk about them all, um, but what I am going to talk about today is they are um, looking to actively sanction people who are hostile to outsiders. It's not just enough to not be racist. It, you have to be hostile to people that you might perceive to be racist. And you see this in a lot of um, different examples. So Jason runs the front of the house at a Bridgeport restaurant and bar, and he tells me a story of seeing someone get harassed and overtly challenging the perpetrators. He says, no one deserves to talk to someone like that or even come in here and disrespect anybody. You know what I'm saying? That's fucked up. We don't go about that here. We don't allow that shit. I'm very happy with the crowd here. You've got artists, you've got feminists, fucking badass girls, and you've got black people. There's not one like specific crowd that comes here. Um, what I want to point out here is that undefending the neighborhood involves a process of moving from it being a closed space to an open space. But what you do need to keep in mind, and I'm happy to talk about this during um, the Q&A, is that the morality of it is complicated. Uh, because there are people in the neighborhood that talk about how they like the fact that Bridgeport is changing in these ways, but they also realize that a lot of the people that are pushing for the changes are maybe pushing for the changes because they, um, for not totally altruistic reasons. They're like, it's great that it's becoming this different way, but the people that are doing this own a lot of property and they realize that like they're not going to get paid if they don't do it um, this way. Now, maybe that doesn't matter, right? Maybe good change is good, regardless of whether somebody's getting paid for it, but it is something to keep in mind. Um, so I want to move on to the last case, which is exploitation disorder in Woodlawn. Um, Woodlawn is a neighborhood on the south side of Chicago, just south of um, High Park, where University of Chicago is. Um, and this is a map. Um, it's presented by an urban planner at a public meeting I attended, I think from 2017, that shows that um, vacant lots of Woodlawn. And vacant lots are really important in Woodlawn, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, I believe this shows that there are 106 acres of vacant parcels split roughly between the city and the private owners. Um, it's these vacant lots that are in a lot of ways responsible for local rappers and international celebrities, Tanya West. Um, this was years ago before Tanya became current Tanya. Um, and a chance the rapper showing up in front of a corner store at 63rd and Cottage Grove to hold an impromptu political rally for mayoral candidate Anara Anaya. Um, that's Anara Anaya. She did not win the election, but she was running that year. Um, she made it pretty explicit. She said, We chose this location because, as many of you know, the Woodlawn community is ground zero for many things. When we talk about issues of displacement and gentrification, this will be the community where the Obama Presidential Center will be housed, and we want to make sure. Um, that the residents of this community can talk about why it is important that we talk about ways to prevent people from being pushed out of their community. Um, when I started this study, there was no worry about this. Um, President Obama was still in the White House. There hadn't been an announcement about where his presidential library was going to be, and Woodlawn was mostly known for being empty and violent. And in 2015, it was announced that the Obama Presidential Center would be placed in Jackson Park by Lake Michigan um, in the eastern part of the neighborhood. And all of a sudden, Woodlawn was known for something else. It was still known for being empty and violent, but paradoxically, this is what made it so attractive to some people. As Anaya mentioned, housing prices did immediately start to soar. And all those empty lots that were eyesores at best and active contributors to crime, violence, and disorder at worst were all of a sudden very, very valuable pieces of real estate. Um, and the race was on to see who would control them. Um, so I want to give a little bit of background here on how all this happened. To start with, Woodlawn was not always known for being empty and violent. Um, in fact, it was at one time a glamorous internationally known neighborhood. The site of the 1893 World's Fair, which brought 27 million people to Chicago, um, to Woodlawn, and to the world's first Ferris wheel. Um, it's also the location, that World's Fair, 
Um, if you ever had Pabst Blue Ribbon beer, that's where Pabst Blue Ribbon got its blue ribbon. Um, Woodlawn was the center of culture and commerce for much of the 20th century. Uh, the first elevated train line, the L, um, in Chicago is built in Woodlawn to bring guests to the World's Fair, and the current title holder for the oldest restaurant in the cities, Dailies, was built in the late 19th century to feed the workers who were building the infrastructure for the fair. Uh, at one time, Woodlawn's major commercial corridor, this is um, a commercial map, um, 63rd Street was not only the second busiest shopping street in the city of Chicago, but also, I've been told, the second busiest shopping street in America between Atlanta and Denver. Um, then Woodlawn underwent a rapid amount of depopulation in the late 20th century. This is attributable to a number of issues, including the drying up of the tax base, and systematic disinvestment in black urban neighborhoods after white flight, the rise of gang violence in the neighborhood, and the reluctance of businesses to sustain black neighborhoods in Chicago after um, the uprisings in reaction to Dr. King's assassination. Combined with the spring of insurance arsons in the 60s and 70s, Woodlawn became a very different place in the experience of its residents and in the public imagination. Now, merchants talk to me a lot about the reputation that Woodlawn has for danger, in much the same way that merchants in Bridgeport talk about the reputation for racism. Not necessarily totally accurate at this point, but still extremely consequential. So Mike, who owns the restaurant that I was talking about daily, puts it this way. 99.9% .9 of the people I know in this neighborhood are good people, are hardworking people, and good family people, and take care of the family. And then the, you know, once you get one bad apple, they want to paint the whole neighborhood like shit, you know? Throw shit at the whole neighborhood, and it's not right. Because you know what happens then? People don't come here. They don't come to the local businesses. You can't help the local community. Franklin, who owns the neighborhood chamber of commerce, points out how Woodlawn is victim to not only its particular reputation, but to a broader stereotype about black neighborhoods. The country already thinks the black neighborhoods are violent and you can't do any business there. So I don't think we're different from other places in that regard. And if we want to, we'll have to do like other places and try to at least start systematically or slowly working on business development. We're dealing with this perception. A big part of this reputation comes from Woodlawn's emptiness and its vacant lots, as I said, and that's what I'm talking about now. Um, so research is going back at least to Thrasher's work in, on gangs in the 20s have demonstrated a connection between liminal territory, so territory between two areas, and disorder, and there's plenty of it in Woodlawn. Indeed, in talking with mothers of young children in the neighborhood as part of a different project I was working on, I heard stories of vacant lots and abandoned buildings serving as sites of gangland executions, as trap houses for drug trafficking, and generally as places that were part of the reason many parents didn't let their kids go outside. Uh, contemporary research corroborates a lot of these suspicions as connections can be made between empty lots and urban violence. In Woodlawn, though, with the impending development of the Obama Presidential Center, these empty lots can be associated with something else, too, which is money. And indeed, many of the merchants that I spoke with thought about it in these terms. To do, give two quick examples, Corey, who's a neighborhood pastor and entrepreneur, identified vacant buildings in the southern part of the neighborhood as sites of opportunity. Uh, he says there are a bunch of vacant warehouse buildings, and he said these facilities would be good for, um, especially since we're so close to the railroad, I believe they'd be good for Amazon warehouses, things of that sort. Um, similarly, Jane, a neighborhood booster who works for a community organization that encourages development in the area, identifies vacant lots as neighborhood assets. There's a ton of vacant lots, she says, and I'm sure you're familiar with some of the challenges people talk about with vacant lots being, you know, unsightly blights, and obviously vacant lots can bring negative attention to a neighborhood. When in the case of Woodlawn, I think through the city's program, the large lab program, for a while people were buying vacant lots for only a dollar, and that's been successful. And for us, those are opportunities because vacant lots can be community gardens, so vacant lots can be purchased, or maybe new properties can be built um, or new businesses. So I think there's a lot of opportunities for growth. These folks aren't in charge of what Logan and Moss would call the local growth coalition, though, and that's why development seems to be happening in Woodlawn in a different way than it would elsewhere. And this is an important point that I really want to um, emphasize. In the other two neighborhoods that I talked about, the development elites are typically the business owners, um, or at least aligned with them through an organization like the Chamber of Commerce. Woodlawn is different, though. Because of the massive institutional disinvestment in the neighborhood in the latter part of the 20th century, there was a power vacuum that was filled by alternative power institutions like churches, and specifically the Apostolic Church of God. Apostolic is one of the larger churches in the neighborhood, and indeed on the south side of Chicago. I've been told that at its height, it boasted about 20,000 members. It's been shepherded since 2008 by Dr. Byron T. Brazier. Um, he succeeded his father, Bishop Arthur M. Brazier, who had been pastor there for almost 50 years. 
Um, he's the most significant and public figure of Black political power in the neighborhood. Apostolic activity in the community has historically gone beyond the religious, though, the, as they have also served as important movers in the realm of politics and real estate. They've been especially active around the planning of the Obama Presidential Center, uh, which will be built a few blocks away. And though the population of the neighborhood is roughly a quarter of what it was in the 60s, there's still concern in the community that current residents might be pushed out. Much of the debate related to the OPC centered around whether or not there would be a community benefits agreement or CBA um, with Woodlawn. Um, a CBA agreement, um, a CBA is a pact between an incoming institution and the neighborhood it's inhabiting to make certain provisions to guarantee the protection and prosperity of people in the neighborhood. It guarantees jobs, it guarantees um, rents remain at certain um, levels for the people that live there. Um, it guarantees that the merchants that are there can benefit from the development that's gonna happen. The Obama Foundation was adamant that there would be no CBA and has Dr. Brazier, um, act has Dr. Brazier, who's publicly suggested it would be an in, insult to the first black president to ask for a CBA in Woodlawn. Yet there was a sense among some in the community that Apostolic's opposition was really less in respect for President Obama and more in desire not to see their position as a neighborhood um, power diluted by others. Apostolic has organized meetings, lots of meetings focused on gentrification and displacement. One meeting was framed on in terms of getting input from the community on the potential changes the library would bring. Um, and I attended this one. Um, and then what I love about community meetings is that people gossip at these meetings a lot. Um, at this particular meeting, I was at a round table and people at the table were talking about lots of different things, including how at least the last two aldermen in the neighborhood had been indicted. Um, I did some research, it turns out to be more than that. Um, they also suggested conspiracy theories about who really snitched to get Fred Hampton assassinated by the police and the FBI. Um, what people really like to talk about in these meetings, though, is the other people that are in the room. After finding out that I was doing research in the neighborhood, an older Black woman at my table named Eleanor gave me sort of a running commentary on the night as it unfolded. She questioned whether the night was actually a chance for community input, distinguishing between input and the appearance of input. She pointed out the money that poured into apostolic. This money is funded by grant money, she said. And Dr. Brasher acknowledged all of this later when he suggested that the foundations had taken Woodlawn off their list for money because they had been so successful at reducing violence. He joked saying, and this is a quote, I said, we have to go back to 23, um, meaning 23 homicides a year, as it was earlier in the decade, before he'll give us some money. And they said, yes. The moment the vote, the most controversy that night though, and the deepest roll of Eleanor's eyes came late in the meeting when a person presenting mentioned that Apostolic was gonna be asking um, the city of Chicago to turn over control over all the vacant lots that they owned in the city. Um, people in the audience seemed shocked by this. It was framed by Apostolic as putting brakes on the sale of land assets to groups without the interests of the community at heart. The evening ended with a sense of unease among the attendees because there's a growing recognition that while the empty lots might have historically been a blight, they are so represent financial and political opportunity to anybody that's able to control them now. Given the fact that so much of the property is currently owned by the city, this control is contingent largely on who can make a moral claim to represent Woodlawn, and this is where Woodlawn is different from some of the neighborhoods. Apostolic is an important spiritual institution, but it's also a huge landowner and the political face of the neighborhood. And for anyone from the city or elsewhere who wants to get something done in the neighborhood, they have to go through the church. It's historically been in from the, benefited from this role, but it's been dependent on portraying themselves as protector of the neighborhood. If there's nothing to protect, their role is diminished. So we have a situation where Apostolic has benefited financially, not in spite of the neighborhood's reputation for violence, but specifically because of it. Um, a few examples to demonstrate this point historically, um, that's Dr. Brazier. Um, in the 1960s, they got a lot of war on poverty money. Um, the war on poverty money came with strings. The particular strings that it came with um, was that it had to be um, go through the Woodlawn organization, which was the social service arm of Apostolic, partnering with the local gang of Blackstone Rangers to provide job training. The money eventually stopped coming after a sentence of investigation led to the termination of the program, but not before Apostolic let the Rangers get away with a lot of violence because they were the meal ticket. Another example of this was the tear down a part of the L train tracks in the 1990s. As I mentioned before, there were the first L tracks in Chicago, um, but in the 90s, the coalition led by Apostolic lobbied for the tracks to get torn down. The rationale was that it was a place where vice was happening, where drug deals were happening, where prostitution was happening. Uh, but once it got torn down, 
it turned out that Apostolic owned a lot of surrounding land, which they were able to develop into single family homes and use woodlawn and make a lot of money. Uh, finally, bring, this brings us to the vacant lots today. Under the auspices of protecting the vulnerable in Woodlawn, Apostolic is currently trying to gain control of the vacant property if they can, right as it's becoming more and more valuable. Of course, the business community of Woodlawn would like to see the land developed too, but they're more concerned with its immediate ramifications for themselves, whereas Apostolic is playing a longer game. Local community organizer James explains it to me this way. Some neighborhood actors are waiting for this time period, right? To cash in, you know, band is power. So yeah, that somebody's going to make a ton of money off these empty lots, whether it be the city, whether it be community-based organizations, whether it be churches, whether it be individuals, somebody is going to sell. So to sell up, the negative reputation with bond works in much the same way the negative reputation works in Bridgeport up to the point. That is to say, for the most of the folks that I talk to, um, the reputation for violence was something to be denied and ideally done away with. It's harmful to the merchants in Woodlawn. Unlike Bridgeport, though, there's a powerful institution with financial stake in the maintenance of this negative reputation because it actually benefits them and the money flows that come into the neighborhood. Um, so I want to conclude briefly with some broad thoughts about how reputation works in these neighborhoods. Um, and I'm going to start with Donald Trump, actually. Um, he says, we have a situation, again, about our inner cities. Inner cities are hell. Um, implicit in this claim about Chicago being hell is a comparison. Chicago is unsafe, or perhaps the cities are unsafe. All claims about the way somewhere or someone fundamentally is are based on implicit comparisons. Um, to lose a lighter example, this is a cartoon that might be relevant to Wicker Park, which is the theory of hipster relativity, which is that there's nothing axiomatic about being a hipster. It's just somebody that's more hipster than you as a hipster. So the guy in the suit calls the guy a button up a hipster, who calls the guy with the banjo a hipster, who calls, I guess, a unicorn and a smoking jacket or something in a hipster. Um, I argue, though, that reputation isn't just relational, but that it's actually the subject of what Andy Abbott calls fractal distinction, um, which means that the pattern that appears at a higher level repeat themselves at a lower level. Abbott talks about this in terms of social science disciplines. So you find people doing quantitative work and qualitative work divide themselves. But even within those groups, they divide themselves again, and it keeps going and going and going. Um, that's the example Abbott used, but he means it as a general um, as a general pattern in social life. I think reputation works this way as well, and I think it is often done so to particularly destructive consequences. Um, so going back to Trump, he says you walk down the street in Chicago and you get shot, and this implies something about Chicago and maybe cities more general being unsafe than other places, perhaps more rural or suburban or whiter places being safe. Um, so the response I would often get in Chicago was saying, well, no, that's actually not true. If you look at the data, rural places are actually more unsafe than urban places. What you would get was people saying, well, yeah, that's right. But like, it's not Chicago is unsafe. Chicago is mostly fine. The north side's fine, but it's the south side that's unsafe. And then you would talk to people on the south side and they would say, well, yeah, I hear that recognition about the south side, but that's not true. It's actually, different neighborhoods like Chatham is fine Hyde Park is fine like go to like Inglewood or Woodlawn that's unsafe and you go to those neighborhoods and they're like okay well people say that but it's really about like it's not about Woodlawn it's about East Woodlawn near the O block um it's not about West Woodlawn where the church is and then you go to East Woodlawn and they'll talk about different blocks and then you go to the different blocks and they'll talk about different uh housing and then you go to the different housing and they have to, we'll talk about different families and what this ends up doing is that the blame keeps getting passed on and on and on. There's always a scapegoat. Now, to be clear, this is not a claim as an example that everybody does this, nor is it a claim that facts don't matter. There are more dangerous and less dangerous places, and understanding why they're dangerous and trying to make them safer is laudable. What I'm talking about, though, is the fact that if reputational processes act like fractals, they can always create more inequality, whether what they describe as true or not, because they incentivize people to save their own reputations at the expense of somebody else. My neighborhood is fine if you looked over there. The fact of the matter is that we all are both creatures of and subject to reputational patterns that repeat in these infinite fractals. The mechanism for how they repeat, at least when, talk, at least when talking about bad reputations, is defensiveness and rejection of solidarity. A reputational claim isn't disputed, but sought off to someone else until we all become scapegoaters and scapegoats in equal measure. Um, thank you very much.
Thank you, Jeffrey. That was a lot. <laughs> I, I said, I thought he was going to do it for like one neighborhood, and maybe two. He said, I'm going to get all three in. And, and he did. Um, a lot to think about. I, I like that our speaker last week mentioned Jay Z. And then we got Jay Z in Brooklyn, and then we got Kanye West over in Woodlawn. I think uh, my chance of rapper in challenge. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but a lot to think about about the way in which reputations of places uh, impact processes of neighborhood change and gentrification and displacement and, and that battle who wins and who loses and how they use the reputation in a particular way to benefit themselves. So it was just a, a great presentation. We are to end at. 6.30, but um, she went on, so, but I want yeah. to <laughs> so hopefully we can stay a little bit longer and not end exactly at 6.30, but some of you might have to go, and so please leave, but I think our conversation will probably go on for, you know, 15, 20 minutes, so okay. for as long as y'all want to talk. All right, <laughs> so questions for Jeffrey on his presentation. Yeah. I'm curious what the, uh, Current political situation in Bridgeport is. Mm -hmm. Because you, know, you mentioned, like, obviously, you've been a very long standing um, center of, like, you know, white ethnic working class, like, right. kind of background, that kind of power. But right. You probably see that on the wane and not just in Chicago, but most American, most industrial American cities. Um, so I'm wondering if there's been, like, a corresponding political shift. And if so, have they kind of played a role in maybe trying to address this um, reputation that their neighborhood has. Yeah, so they're pretty explicit about it. Um, politically, the biggest thing that's happened in Bridgeport in the last couple of years is that um, the alderman, Patrick D. Thompson, I'll give you a guess what the D stands for daily, um, got indicted and convicted on, um, gosh, I forget, I, I hit the... Chicago, I hit the Chicago trifecta. Alderman, all three of the neighborhoods I studied ended up getting indicted. So sometimes I confuse which one got indicted for what. I think he got indicted in like a money laundering scheme involving a local bank. Um, but they had to appoint a new alderman and then that alderman ran. And um, the new alderman um, is Chicago's first Asian American alderman. Um, very much part of the machine. Her father was in the Daly administration or the Richard M. Daly administration. Um, but um, it's the first Asian American alderman in Chicago, um, which was um, a big deal. That like coming from Bridgeport, Bridgeport is now uh, not majority, but plurality Asian American. So like there are people really trying to put a different face on what Bridgeport is. Um, and you also see that there have been businesses, there are a lot of businesses opened in Bridgeport that are trying to like be very explicit about it, um, about it's like we're making Bridgeport something new. This is, some people are like lived there in the past and remembered like, like Ed, who I talked about is like half Korean, half Polish, and he remembers like people being racist shit to him. Um, and the, he's like one of the big um, movers and shakers of the neighborhood and he wants to change things, partly because he wants to change things, I suspect, and partly also because he's gonna make money off of it, as I alluded to. Um, so you see businesses coming in and being really explicit about it, um, but you also see businesses um, getting banalized, right? Um, Black Lives Matter displaced, smashed by jag off is a term that is only used in Chicago and Pittsburgh, as far as I know. Uh, it basically means schmuck. Um, black and business in East Bridgeport due to vandalism. Um, this is a different black and business house of melanin that was, um, that is open, still open, but it also had, um, Vandalism, a lot of this vandalism was very like politically and racially specific. It would say like BLDM, Black Lives Don't Matter. Um, there are also like during um, the summer of 2020, there were bat wielding vigilantes just sort of like wandering around the neighborhood. So you have that, but then you have people pushing against it. Um, Bridgeport neighbors rallied to support a black owned beauty salon that had its window shattered by a vandal with a sledgehammer. Um, Bridgeport, I mean, this is like a leftist uh, news organization, but Bridgeport Chicago's message to racists not in my neighborhood. Um, this doesn't mention Bridgeport in the headline, but that's what it's about. Push officials for answers after video shows police standing by as white vigilantes patrol during protests. So 
I mean, the answer is that the conflict is still ongoing. There is a group that is very active about changing not only the perception of the neighborhood, but what's actually happening in the neighborhood. But to speak to the fractals, uh, when you talk to people, a lot of them will be like, well, Bridgeport is not racist. It's like East Bridgeport that's racist. Like West Bridgeport is fine. It's like the old people. I mean, East Bridgeport is where the Daly's house is. It's where the older people are. It's the Irish and Italian section of the neighborhood. Um, and it's like, they're like, it muddies up some things because I know for a fact that there are people, like it might be true in some sense, but I know for a fact, I've been to East Bridgeport and hung out with people there that are anti-racist. And I have heard people use the N word in West Bridgeport. It's not as simple as that. And like drawing these lines, which is what reputation ultimately is about to me, I think ends up creating, and I mean, again, Gerald Zellis talks about cognitive maps, that like we have the maps in our heads of cities, um, and that we might have a really granular understanding of like where we live and maybe where we work, but the rest of this map in our head is pretty blurry. Even in like this one neighborhood, like you don't really know what's going on in most parts of the neighborhood. Um, so yeah, Bridgeport, I would say, I mean, it's an ongoing political project, both in terms of um, trying to change the reputation, but also trying to change um, what's going on on the ground. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so during the pandemic, like um, former Mayor Air Lori like put up yeah. distributed the pa uh, vaccines throughout like very low income mm -hmm. to minority group uh, neighborhoods, and she waited last minute to announce it. Yeah. Um, like, has there been like the in, in, like the impact of like the reflection of like these communities that were just received the vaccine grace? Hmm. I have no idea, actually. Sorry, I don't know the answer to that question. The one thing that I can tell you that's interesting, and this has to do with like the way um, community areas are drawn, um, oh, is that I mean, Robert Vargas wrote a book about this. Um, that Bridgeport, despite not being um, particularly low income, encompasses enough low income census tracts that it was in one of the. Um, they did get the vaccine before everybody else, along with a bunch of other neighborhoods. And that has everything to do with how like maps are drawn and political power. But I don't actually know about the ramifications of that. I'm sorry. No, it's not. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you so much for the presentation. So, so much interesting stuff. Um, I love this idea of reputation. I lived in New Haven for a couple yeah. years and man, street by street. It's mm -hmm. like, can't go there, can't go there. You right. know, it's very interesting. Um, so my question is, after looking at the reputational impacts in these different neighborhoods, I mean, obviously you weren't there long enough to see reputations change, and it seems like these reputations have been very durable for right. a long time. Um, do you have sort of a theory of reputational change or what can be done to? Um, so that's a good question. Um, so I, the main theory is that reputations are very durable. Um, I mean, one big answer is to the extent that reputations do change. Um, you know, I mean, I'm a sociologist, so this is interesting to surprise you on this money. Um, that I remember going to Bridgeport and telling one of my professors that I was going to Bridgeport. This was before I was ever studying it. There was just like a bar I liked there. Um, and this professor had also gone to Chicago, but back in like the 1970s. And he's like, you're going to Bridgeport? Why are you going to Bridgeport? And it's like, oh, well, there's all like, like Bridgeport. The other thing about Bridgeport, in addition to all this stuff is that there's a big art scene. There's a it's become, as areas on the north side of the city have become too expensive for people to live in, Bridgeport has become one of the hipster neighborhoods in Chicago. Um, so, like, you know, they're like illegal, um, what, or we'll say non-licensed um, indie rock shows um, and art showings in Bridgeport. And he's like, what are you doing there? All, I, all that was in Bridgeport when I was a graduate student were like the terrible smell from the meat packing factories that are immediately to the south and like square politicians. Um, and the reason that it's changed is because a lot of people came in with money um, and started putting up, um, started doing things that we would call gentrification. Um, and this gets into all sorts of debates about the positives and the negatives of gentrification. But like, Bridgeport is probably less affordable than it was um, 20 years ago, although it's actually still massively affordable. Um, one of the reasons that the costs have gone up is because people have come in and put in bars and art galleries and art studios and music venues 
and it's mostly people of color. And part of it is an effort, like these are people that grew up in the neighborhood and didn't feel welcome. And they want to make it into a neighborhood that is more welcoming to um, people like them. Um, but they're also driving the prices up. Um, so the reputation for Bridgeport has started to change a little bit. Like people, old school people will still tell you it's racist. Younger people will tell you it's like where the hipsters are. Uh, one of my favorite stories is I was talking, I was in South Shore at my friend's birthday party and I met um, Aaron, who was a public school teacher, he's about my age. And he was telling me he was, um, he's, he's a black guy. Um, and he like a lot of people of color in Bridgeport, like, his parents had told him never go to this neighborhood. It's basically a sundown town throughout the 20th century. So he's sitting in a coffee shop because he likes the neighborhood, he likes the bars, he likes the coffee shop, he's grading papers and he, it's going fine. He's there all day. And then some older white woman, like he sees her like staring at him towards the end of the day. And he's like, damn, like it's gonna happen. There's gonna be, somebody's gonna say something messed up to me and my parents were right. And she comes up to him and whispers and like points to a hipster in line at the coffee shop and says, these people are ruining the neighborhood. <laughs> um, so at least for some people there, the salient thing that, the, the salient feature of Bridgeport, what's ruining Bridgeport is not um, minorities, which is what people in the 1950s, 1960s might uh, be talking about, but the hipsters moving in from Wicker Park and Tulsa. Yeah. You mentioned some of the shifting boundaries. And yeah. I'm curious if the shifting boundaries and the name changes that we see in yeah. areas gentrify would be a reputational change strategy. Yeah. Oh, I think so. Definitely. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I just apologize to <laughs> it. <laughs> um, yeah, real estate companies definitely try to drive this, either by creating new neighborhoods or by trying to say one neighborhood is a different neighborhood. Like I remember um, when my last month in, so I, I went to college in BC and then I lived here for a while. And before I moved to Chicago, I had to, um, I had to get a sublet for like one or two months. Um, I was living in Columbia Heights at the time. So I was like looking in, in like Columbia Heights or maybe even looking at Adams Morgan. Um, and by, I typed in the Craigslist and I found this, um, I found a location and it was pretty cheap. And I'm like, oh, well, that's just amazing. Then I looked at the location and keep in mind, this is like 2008. So it was not as fancy as now. It's like, this isn't Columbia, this isn't Adams Morning. This is like Petworth um, that people will call things. I mean, the same thing happened in Brooklyn in New York in the early 2000s that it's like, you know, there's Williamsburg is Bushwick, Bushwick is deep Bushwick and deep Bushwick is just like somewhere out on Long Island. Uh, the Chicago example here is um, Wicker Park. Um, just above Wicker Park is a neighborhood called Bucktown. And the story they give is that back in the day there were goats there. But the story I've been told by people is like this neighborhood didn't exist until like the eighties when real estate um, markers decided it's like we needed to come up with like a charming story about this area to be able to sell it to people. Um, so yeah, real estate um, brokers um, play a huge role in this. Chicago is a little bit interesting because Chicago's neighborhood boundaries are relatively stable because back in the 20s, a bunch of social scientists created these neighborhood um, boundaries and neighborhood names, and they've mostly stayed the same. But Wicker Park wasn't on that. Wicker Park is in a larger area that's called West Town. Um, so um, yeah, what, what neighborhoods get called um, is, is definitely part of it. Another example in Chicago is East and West Longdale, um, one of which is um, La Vita, a little village. Like the, how a neighborhood is referred to by name um, does a whole lot of work in the, the reputational draw it has for certain people. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I um, was wondering, you've done all this like research about how how the reputation stuff works. And I feel like I'm in conversations a lot where people say like, my city, like this area is bad to get into, <laughs> or like, especially like Chicago and Detroit, people are like, and it drives me crazy. Right. How would you like, you know, tell someone, how would you explain to someone like why they're thinking that without saying like, well, it's actually this part is bad. Which is <laughs> something that I've, I've discovered is not good. Um I mean, it depends on who you're talking to, right? Like, you know, if you're talking to your friends, your answer is going to be different than if you're talking to your professor, which is going to be different than if you're talking to your grandmother. Um, you know, like, I mean, I had conversations with people in my family, like when I went to 
Chicago for grad school, and they're like, is Chicago dangerous? And I'm like, yeah. no, Chicago isn't dangerous. And the other thing that gets into this is like the role of networks, right? You look at somebody like Andy Papakrisos's work. I talk about neighborhoods and the symbolic value of neighborhoods, but a lot of like what makes a place dangerous or not dangerous, to use your example, doesn't have to do with like the physical neighborhood you're in. It has to do with like what networks you're connected to. Um, but yeah, I mean, like the answer is that like cities are complicated places. So are rural areas, so are suburbs. I mean, I just showed you that article that like there are more gun deaths in rural counties in America than there are in urban counties. Um, like, I, I I don't know exactly what you'd say based on, what, what, where are you talking about? What what area? Where? Yeah, uh, I'm from Louisville. Louisville, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I've been to Louisville a couple of times. I don't know it well enough to, to comment. Um, but that, the ideas that we have about neighborhoods are socially constructed and deeply, deeply persistent and embedded in long histories that have to do with racial and class dynamics. Um, and I mean, the main thing that I would do if they can do it, and not everybody's gonna do it, is just point out that it's like, okay, think about the city you're in. How many parts of the city you're in would you say you actually know really, really well? So not, not other parts of the country, not like, Chicago or LA or New York, like the city that you live in, how many neighborhoods would you say, like, you know really well, you know who to go to for a haircut, you know who to go to to fix your car? Like, I'm from Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I spent a lot of time in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I'm an urban sociologist. And there are parts of Winston-Salem, North Carolina that I, to use Subtle's term, my cognitive maps are a little bit fussy on. Um, so to just get people thinking about that, um, and like encouraging sort of, I guess, do we call it an intellectual humility, both in yourself and in other people is really useful. Like, I think the thing, that, one of the big things that I've learned doing the research um, that I do is that we know so little about the social world, the social worlds that we occupy. Um, and we use heuristics, these mental shortcuts for so much, because if we didn't, like we basically couldn't function, right? If you've read, Derek Zimmel wrote in Metropolis and Mental Life that if, we, if people in cities tried to actually respond to like every bit of sensory information that came at them, they would have nervous breakdowns. Um, and that's not just true in cities, that's true everywhere. Um, so like we have to use mental shortcuts and that's fine. Like, but what you need to be aware of is that there's all this research that says that those mental shortcuts often end up being things like racial stereotypes. Um, that there's research by, like I alluded to, I think Quillian and Pager talk about how like there could be two neighborhoods with identical crime rates, but if some one neighborhood has um, a higher percentage of African-American males than the other, people would automatically assume that that neighborhood has higher crime rates with no other evidence. Um, so yeah, just sort of encourage people to think about like how well do you actually know the places you think you know? Uh, do you want then? Um, just two more questions. Okay. So yeah, I found it very interesting when you said that some people in Woodlawn sort of like the fact that their neighborhood has a reputation for being dangerous. Yeah. It didn't go in the direction I was expecting it to go. I found it really interesting yeah. the way you talked about um, the church as an actor that benefited right. from that. But it reminded me of this tweet I saw. I'm sure it was at least partially in jest. But it was like, um, I I like I will shoot a gun into the air. I know but exactly the tweet like, you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. To keep the rent down. Um, and I was wondering, is there anyone in Woodlawn who's, who like sort of um, uh, supports the reputation of the neighborhood as dangerous because it seems like a firewall against gentrification making it less attractive. To gentrification. Nobody told me that. I, I That tweet is funny. Um, yeah. And I think that there might be some truth to that. Like, not in this neighborhood, but like, I don't think that's a totally outlandish thing that like that there is probably, um, I don't think anybody wants to live in a dangerous neighborhood. I think that there is probably, um, you can get value out of living, like just from purely financial perspective, you can get value out of living in a neighborhood that people think is dangerous for totally like ridiculous racist reasons. Um, that like I've lived in neighborhoods, so I live in neighborhood New Orleans now that like, well, I moved there and my family's like, are you sure you want to live in this neighborhood? I'm like this neighborhood is fine. Um, and the prices are cheaper than in a neighborhood that like some of my family suggested, like significantly cheaper. And the fact of the matter is almost definitely that like people probably undervalue the neighborhood because they think it's dangerous for like pretty explicitly racist reasons. So I am benefiting 
from really, really socially destructive processes going on. Um, but no, I don't think anybody actually wants their neighborhood to be right. I'm talking about the but um, but yeah, I don't know. I've never I've never talked to somebody who says we need to make people think this neighborhood is dangerous. It's I guess it's possible, but that has never come up in my research. Yeah. So you said you're from Winston. I'm from Charlotte. Oh, I always think yeah. about like how things can apply to North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering how do you think um, if the reputational durability might differ between like relatively younger cities like Raleigh and Charlotte that have expanded more recently right. versus more established, almost calcified cities like Chicago and New York? That's a great question. Um, I don't know. Um, because, I mean, you you do see it at, like, Charlotte, right? Like, I mean, Charlotte in the, like, you know, in the 1960s, it is new. Like, the development of it is new. In the 1960s, 1970s, it was, like, a relatively small city, and it's, like, rapidly expanded through the rise of things like banking. Um, but some of the same processes that you see, like, so the story in places like Chicago, New York, Baltimore, Philadelphia is the industrialization. And you get that story to a smaller degree in a place like Charlotte. So like Nodad was basically like a mill town, right? Um, it's, you don't get the story explicitly because there was more industry in the North than there was in the South, but you're going to get the same processes because, I mean, the, the very short version of this is I tell my students that the reason the South became economically dynamic in the um, middle of the 20th century is because of three things. Um, the rise of air conditioning, um, cities deciding they couldn't be, like, explicitly racist, um, and terrible union laws. Um, so all of a sudden you had industry moving down from the North to the South. Um, but that is now, now those industries in the South are moving to other places that have even worse labor laws, right? Um, so you have a place like Noda that used to have like mills and it's like Winston-Salem, um, where I'm from, was the cigarette capital of America. I went to R.J. Reynolds High School. Um, I went to a cigarette factory um, at a sort of birthday party when I was in second grade. Um, saw how cigarettes were made. Um, and like, as that got sent somewhere else, like they need to use those buildings and those buildings are now hipster lofts and cocktail bars, right? Um, one of the things that I'm really interested in now, and this is what my current project is on, you, you provided a wonderful segue, um, <laughs> is what this looks like at a regional level. Um, so one of the things that people ask me, particularly people on my committee ask me, um, was like, okay, well, you're like looking at these neighborhoods. Um, well, what does this look like? at the level of a city or a state or a region? And my answer was, I don't know, because I wasn't looking at a city or a state or a region. Um, but like, what does it mean for a region to have a reputation? So like the American South, for example. So this is my current project is, what does it mean for the American South to have a reputation as a racist place, right? Because the American South is like, Virginia, but it's also Texas, but it's also Florida, but it's also, you know, New Orleans, which is different from the rest of Louisiana. Um, so I'm doing a multi-city study, starting in Atlanta, also looking at Birmingham, Alabama, and New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, this is, um, contingency all, always matters. So Chicago is a very specific case. The reason the neighborhoods are sort of as solid as they are is because they emerged at a certain time in American history and a certain time in industrial history. And it is a little different in Charlotte. I don't know exactly how it's gonna look different, but I mean, I think what you wanna do, like what also good social science does is you like identify the broad patterning and then allow room for historical contingency. So if you're interested in doing work in Charlotte, you can find the thing that's unique about Charlotte. Um, I don't know exactly what it is, but I would like to know. So, yeah. Thank you. All right, well, with, with that, um, we'll conclude. And I would just say that, you know, I think Jeffrey's work is groundbreaking because of its complicated analysis of gentrification through place reputation. That's one thing. But the other thing is a lot of the gentrification studies, particularly here in DC, looks at what's moving into low-income minority communities. And Jeffrey's work is one of the first ones to have within it the case of Bridgeport, which is a working class white area that is being gentrified with a diverse minority population. So I think his work is going to complicate the ways in which we think about race and racism. 
and how it plays out in processes of gentrification. Um, so I want to say thank you. And I can't wait to read your book when it comes <laughs> out, but thank you for joining us and for the conversation. And we have a little, little swag. Oh, thank you, swag. Thank you. you. But thank you. Thank you very much.